morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it might be for you, and welcome to the Leadership Connection. I'm Doug Thucknett, and today I'm honored to have an old friend here by the name of Scott Brown, who works for uh, Shell. And uh, I've known Scott a number of years, basically just through conferences, people that you, you bump into along the way that uh, you might stop and have a conversation with, or maybe even a, a refreshment at, at, at one of the uh, uh, events that go on at conferences and so I've known Scott probably I don't know 10 15 years it seems Scott how you doing today I'm doing good Doug I appreciate you having me on well thank you and Scott's in sunny Florida I'm up here in cold western New York you know about 17 degrees this morning and uh, I don't know they probably got sunshine and uh, you know fresh orange juice and everything where Scott is down in Florida uh, you guys having a good day today? We are. It's uh, 65 here right now, uh, Doug. So uh, we're 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 certainly a little bit different than what you're experiencing up north. Yeah, nice. I'd probably be headed to the golf course around now if I was there. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> we're gonna take a quick pause. What do you need, buddy? So, Scott, if I were in Florida, it'd probably be just about tea time right now, but that's not the case. And uh, uh, although yesterday we did book a trip for the first time in, uh, well, it's pretty close to a year now. So we will be down there uh, end of May. We're both scheduled for the COVID shot coming up next week. We're excited about that and uh, excited for this world to get back to some kind of normalcy, right? Oh, I know it. Can't wait. So, Scott, if you would, please tell our listeners about your background, where you went to school, the companies you worked for, the roles that you worked in. Sure. Well, uh, Doug, I actually grew up in the Northeast um, in the second largest city in the state of Rhode Island, a city called Warwick. Um, I did attend uh, Boston University. I graduated in 1998 with a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, through my four years at, at, at BU, I participated in the Army ROTC program. And um, after graduation, I was commissioned uh, as a second lieutenant in the Army. And I uh, was branched uh, Medical Service Corps. So um, I did some initial training down in uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And then right after that, I went into flight school. So I spent about a year at the Army's uh, helicopter flight school in Fort Rucker, Alabama. And uh, my first duty station out of flight school was Fort Riley, Kansas. And, and that's where I started uh, some of those, uh, some of those uh, lower level leadership roles in the Army. So I started as a forward support medevac team leader. Uh, eventually, I became a maintenance platoon leader. And then before I got out of the Army for about my last year, I was a company operations officer, uh, what we used to call um, a medevac company executive officer. Very good. Uh, in late, yeah, in late 2006, uh, I got out of the Army uh, after going through a series of uh, corporate interviews in, in, a, in a recruiting uh, firm out of uh, North Carolina. And uh, Shell picked me. I picked Shell. And that's really where where I've been for the last 14 years. Um, you know, I started out with Shell offshore, so I worked two weeks on, two weeks off, uh, platform in the Gulf. Uh, my first role was a reliability engineer for the first six and a half years. Um, from there, uh, I came onshore and worked in our uh, main ed, uh, office in um, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, for the next three and a half years. And, and mostly it was, uh, it was still a reliability engineering role, but, but mostly what we were doing was we were reviewing a lot of the uh, maintenance strategies that we had across our assets in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we had some, of course, like every corporation, we have title changes, right? So my day-to-day -day job didn't really change, even though my title did uh, after that role in the office. And I became a senior operations support engineer and I moved into a new project for a new facility um, in uh, late 2016. And I worked on that project from construction through commissioning through handover uh, in the Gulf of Mexico all the way through uh, just last October. 
And in October, I moved to our second newest facility in the Gulf. And uh, I became an operations and maintenance coordinator. So I've been doing that for the last uh, four, four and a half months now. Very good. Now, you would think that I would remember, but uh, again, it's, it's, I don't remember you telling me you had that military background. That's very interesting. So I got to ask you, you know, having been out to a, a few platforms myself, and then you say, gee, I went to flight school uh, with helicopter training and stuff like that. What's it like to give up that control and have that other person uh, be flying you out there and landing on the platform? It wasn't that bad. I, I actually thought about that when I first uh, got my first hitch out there back in, uh, I want to say it was early 2007, my first hitch. And I wondered, how am I going to feel sitting in the back for once, right? And uh, it wasn't that bad. I mean, we, uh, the, the, the contract helicopter company that we have, um, I, I mean, I, I talked with a bunch of their pilots over the years, and they're great people. And uh, most of them, I will say, do have military backgrounds also. Uh, most of the younger ones uh, are probably, I would say, they don't have military backgrounds, but they just graduated their own flight schools, and they're trying to build time. And they're constantly flying, of course, offshore. They work two weeks on, two weeks off, just like we do. So great folks. Outstanding. So in your career, um, are there a couple people that you'd like to discuss that you looked at as mentors? Yes, certainly in the Army. And I will say really early on when I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, my first duty station, um, I got there as a second lieutenant, immediately promoted to first lieutenant. Um, I was I was fortunate enough to have a group commander, uh, Colonel Mark Hildebrand. Um, he was our higher level uh, commander um, at Fort Riley, and the, just his the the way he just um, took us under his wing as junior officers. Uh, he would facilitate uh, frequent discussions uh, with all of us in the group about leadership, about uh, just just um, you know family things like that, and and occasionally he would have one-on-one -on -one sessions with us. I mean, this is a full bird colonel talking with us lowly first lieutenants and captains, and he took the time out to really um, listen to us. Uh, ask about our families, um, start that initial early development for us as junior officers. So he was certainly um, someone that I wanted to aspire to be uh, moving forward. And certainly, you know, when I left the Army and, and I got to, uh, got to Shell, uh, I've had numerous operations managers. Um, there's three in particular that really kind of shaped who I am today. And my first operation manager when I got to Shell is Jim Rizicki. Um, later on, Blake Abair, and finally, um, before he retired, it was Tim Frank. And and they really took me under their wing when 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 I got there, new to the offshore environment, new to oil and gas. And they really uh, started my progression to get me to where I am today. And more, most importantly, because I'm offshore, I interact with a lot of our offshore installation managers. And those guys are the ones that really have helped me out because they, they are literally the captain of the ship. And I am working towards uh, that point in my career today. So I'm almost there. Not quite yet, but it'll eventually come. Outstanding. And now I'm going to back up, if you don't mind, a little bit, Scott. Yes, uh, you talked about doing the ROTC thing. And I, I always uh, you know, have these dreams that, that lots of people listen to these things. And uh, it has become pretty popular. But my dream really is that some young people do. right? And I heard you talk about doing the ROTC program in and, and college. I find that interesting. I had a couple friends do that. And uh, it's funny, you know, if you're not exposed to that somehow, it seems through your family. Um, it never really is an option. Could you tell us a bit about that and what that was like to go through that experience at school? Yeah, and let me start off uh, by saying that my brother, my older brother, uh, he's 10 and a half years older than me. He did that at uh, Providence College. 
So yeah. I actually was inspired by what he did first off. And, and I knew even at, at a young age, I knew that I wanted to fly um, but didn't know whether to go into the Air Force or the Army at that time. And my brother did Army ROTC at his school, so I just naturally did that at BU. And I, and I will say that that, that experience, um, you know, being mentored by those officers and those enlisted personnel that are part of our cadre, uh, certainly at Boston University and, and, and I would guess everywhere that has ROTC, was um, very impactful on my life and and really allowed me to um, know what I wanted to do at least at, at least while I was in the army. Um, I still wanted to fly, and I was lucky enough to be able to uh, be selected for flight school, and 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 uh, and I did that. And and uh, certainly um, the mentorship that I received while in college, while in ROTC, really helped out in in me eventually getting in and mentoring others uh, that were that were um, in my teams and in my uh, platoon. That's pretty cool. I actually have a nephew that is now an orthopedic surgeon and he went in um, the Air Force because they, they picked up his uh, his education on the doctorate's end of that, right? So he's still right now he's currently over uh, Doing some uh, an assignment in the Middle East, uh, but he's stationed um, down in um, San Antonio, Texas. Actually, has uh, married and has has four kids as well. So he's, he's wow, he's that's great. But uh, San Antonio is San Antonio is where I started. Fort Sam Houston is uh, yeah. That's the Army's biggest secret right there. Very cool. So uh, again, I I've always admired people that. That, that took that career path. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so, what are some of the things you would say that motivated you to become a leader? Is that something that started when you were young, or uh, did it actually come as you talked about through the military ex experience? I want to say it started when I was young, and I and believe it or not, I I mean I can kind of pinpoint when it got into my brain. And you know, I, I, I was growing up. I was never involved in organized soccer, but I decided to play. Mo most of my friends were playing already, and I decided to play one year. And I was 11 years old, and my first practice, um, we were probably out there for an hour, hour and a half, doing whatever drills were going on. Of course, I played in the playground, but I had never done it organized. And at the end of practice, the coach told me to come up front and he made me the team captain on the first day. Wow. And, and I had never, I had never really thought of myself as a leader. You know, I had friends and, and, you know, we had school and, 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 you know, we had, we had our own kind of uh, sandlot sports activities, but, but I, never, I never really thought of myself as, as someone who could do that. But, but I, I want to say that that, that point um, at least provided the spark for me. And, and then, you know, fast forward into college, uh, the training and the mentorship I received, uh, like I said before, from those officers and enlisted folks in our cadre for, for the ROTC program were, were um, that, that really solidified uh, for my life that that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to develop others. Uh, if if they were willing to be developed and, and and that's that's where it all started really that's cool and that really leads right into the next topic of conversation which is um, recognizing the traits of leaders so if you're out there looking to hire somebody or promote someone what are some of those traits that you might look for in a leader yeah for hiring I've been fortunate enough to um, to be in some hiring uh, interviews uh, while working in Shell, and and you know it's it, it's hard to see those traits um, when you're asking questions of of uh, younger folks coming out of college, right? Um, you know, you you, you kind of tailor the interview to kind of see if you can pick up. The, you, you know, you're looking for certain words 
in the in their answers that kind of um, indicate that they could be future leaders in the company, right? It's easy to see the technical skills because they've been through quite a bit, uh, mostly engineering folks is, is who I would interview. Uh, it's easy to see those skills, but it's, it's hard to recognize the, the, the leadership traits that we're looking for. Um, now, promoting, promoting leaders within, um, you know, we, we, uh, in, in Shell, you know, we have existing leaders that are in roles. And we also have some folks that are not currently today in leadership roles, but they always are stepping up. They're always saying, hey, I am hearing that um, this person is going to be out on vacation. Can I sit in for that person for these, this two-week period because I want to get some development time? And that's great. That's what we look for. And, and really, that's the start of their kind of leadership journey. And we love that. We love to see that because... Uh, for, for those go-getters, when you're asking to be put in those positions, it's real easy to uh, to um, see those folks later coming up on a, on a formal interview uh, for possibilities of getting to in, in those roles permanently. I certainly can relate. I can tell you, going, going back to my Kodak days, which is, is a large company, they actually did have a, a formal process for um, recognizing and developing leaders but the you know the early piece of that the start of that really is just uh the crew kind of rec recognizing leaders amongst themselves you see the guys that take control you know when you have a shutdown and a large job going on and you let's say you're you've got a a, a large pick that you've got to do in, in terms of hoisting right who are the guys that, that step up and do that who are the people that uh when you have something go wrong in the middle of the night are right there to answer the phone and come in and uh you know you can't always control what people's schedules are so by nature you know when you come in that next morning and something got done you go okay who stepped up you talk to the operations people right and they go wow you should have seen what brian did there last night right uh having never done this job himself and two newer guys coming in with him he really took control that came down and asked questions, made sure that he double checked on things uh, before they got too deep into it. Good stuff like that where you go, okay, there's somebody that we probably ought to look at, right? That's right. That's actually so, right. When I talk to leader Scott, and I don't know if I've asked you this question in the past, I may have because I'm a person that reads quite a bit. Is there a, a book or two or a course that you've taken that, that impacted your career that you could tell our listeners about? I will say that for books, I consume a lot of uh, the John C. Maxwell series, uh, his leadership books. Um, I take nuggets from that. There's, there's, there's two in particular that of course, his leadership handbook. I mean, that that's that that's one that I take nuggets from all the time, and I try to, if I see if I'm if I'm talking with someone, uh, one to one or maybe a small group, I might bring some of those aspects of that leadership handbook up to them if I know that it may you know may or may not help them. Right. His other one uh, that that strikes me a lot, and I take nuggets from, is the is the 21 uh, irrefutable laws of leadership. Um, and like I said, I, I recommend uh, his series uh, to a lot of folks that I've talked to in the past. Um, it, it just it is it, it really is straightforward. Uh, it it res a lot of his writing resonates with um, things that I've experienced in the past, and certainly other other aspects of his books uh, kind of spark me to uh, maybe try something different in my own life. All right. Um. So thinking about leadership, uh, I often hear discussions go on that uh, some folks say that leadership is a natural skill. Others say it's a learned skill. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I want to say that it's probably mostly a learned skill. I, I don't, there may be aspects of it that that may come natural uh, to folks, um, but I, but I, 
I mean, I'm the product of leaders and other mentors in my life that make me feel that uh, where I'm at, it was certainly learned. I don't think I could have reached uh, the levels and continuing continuing to le reach higher levels um, of leadership uh, without that learning from those folks. Yeah, it, you know, when I think about it, I think that first recognition might be the natural piece of it. You know, when somebody like your coach stepped right. up and said, yeah, I want this guy to be captain. And then after that, it really becomes, becomes a, a, a lifelong learning experience because you realize that you make mistakes, right? Absolutely. Um, so, and you don't want to continue to do those things. And th those are really the signs of, of strong leaders are the ones that, that say and recognize, holy smokes, I blew that. Right. And they come back and they, they go, what did I do wrong? Right. And it might even be a conversation with somebody. Right. I can tell you that I uh, have had bosses that have come back and said, hey, I shouldn't have done this or that. And there have been many, many times that me as a person have, have come back and said, boy, I, I really messed that up. I let my emotions get in the way of uh, what should have been a better decision. Right. I have too, certainly. No doubt. Continuous learning. Yeah. So at this point in your career, what would you say is the success that you're most proud of that you've had? Oh, I'm most proud of. I, I had it really has nothing to do uh, with my professional career. I, I would have to say that I'm most proud of my family. You know, my my wife, uh, Sir Mara, uh, we're about to celebrate actually 10 years uh, this year on Cinco de Mayo. Um, and, and our two our two boys, Dean and Eric, uh, they they are the absolute highlight of my life, and and that really trumps anything I've done certainly professionally uh, in my career, both in the army and and with Shell. But you know, Mara, my wife, um, you know, we met in the army back in our Fort Riley days, and she was a uh, Black Hawk mechanic. Uh, she was a medevac crew chief for a number of years. Uh, we like I said, we met in the army. But years later, after we both got out, we kind of reconnected, and uh, we've been together ever since. And 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 uh, you know, I'm so lucky to have her and the boys in my life. You know, I'm I'm gone two weeks out of the month every month, so she is the primary reason we have such a loving home and we have great, well-mannered children. And all the credit certainly goes to her and, and I'm blessed to have such a family. So that really is the the uh the, the greatest success that I could ever that I could ever dream of. You know that is might be the best answer I've heard yet. So uh, I fall into that same type of thing when people ask me about you know what are you proud of it really is my family. You know I, I'm proud of the fact that you know I'm not sure how old your kids are we'll, we'll come back to that. Mine are all grown and I have grandkids, right? So you know you did a good job when they still call you, right? I just got a call this week from my son who was struggling. And he's doing some traveling now early on in his career and struggling with that, right, especially with the, this COVID thing. And uh, he was struggling with a decision that his company made. And, and uh, I gave him the old... <laughs> Hey, look, you work for a company. Those are the way things go. And I know you don't like to hear that. That's not the answer I gave you, you wanted to hear. But we just got back from doing, um, having all the kids uh, down to the hunting camp just to do some sledding, to get away from electronic devices and phones and TVs and laptops and all that crap just to go. It's gaslight place. There's no electricity. And the kids had a blast. Right. And, and of course, we got movies of them going up and down the hill and screaming and laughing. And I said, take some time tonight and watch those. Those are the reason you go to work. Right. That's, that's, that's absolutely why, right. That's why we do what we do. That's why we make that sacrifice. Right. Is so that you can provide that for your kids, those laughter, those memories that they'll have for a lifetime. And that's really why we all do what we do, isn't it? They're only in the house for a short amount of time, Doug. You know that. And and my my oldest is thirteen, my youngest is nine. And um, it's and sometimes it seems like it's going really slow, but it's it's not. You know. And that gets into the fun years. I'll tell you, there's a 
all of a sudden becomes this void. You're you're in the years now where you're going to have pretty much nine more solid years of running your head off, taking places, doing things, going to their events, whatever the heck they got going on in their life. And that's really, I always tell people, that you want good kids, keep them busy, keep them involved in things, right? Uh, and as parents, you do that, and that becomes your life, as, as I can see it has with you and your wife, right? And then all of a sudden, you go to college, and it's like, there's this void, right? And that's when you have to look at one another as a couple and go, Okay, I guess it's our time to be us again. That's yeah, kind of what fun. do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Scott. It's been great talking to you today. It's, it's been too long, and hopefully, you know, once we get through this uh, this pandemic, we'll be able to go back out and do those things, uh, conferences, and, and, and events where we bump into one another. And uh, I'd really enjoy being able to sit down and have a uh, maybe a beer with you. That'd be a great thing. Doug, I appreciate you having me on. It's great to hear you. It's great to see you. And, and you're right. Um, it's been too long since we've gotten together. And like you, I hope I hope this ends uh, soon and, and we'll get back to uh, normal, normal business and, and, and see each other again. Okay, so this has been Doug Plucknett with the Leadership Connection. I want everyone to have a great day today. Have a good one. Bye-bye.